Hello, and welcome back to Let's Play Dual Hearts. Sorry about last episode, it is still my least favorite uh, level in the whole game. I guess it didn't really make for exciting commentary, but now we're back. This episode should be mostly clear sailing. Let's fly up to that plateau we were told to meet Chiffon. You can actually see her on the map, which is kind of unusual, because usually cutscenes in games like this don't go to that level of detail. But first we have to pick up this piece of dream energy on top of this frozen ice tree, or whatever it's supposed to be. I guess we'll see when the level finally gets unfrozen. Because when you actually land close to the valley, cutscene begins. There she is. Mopey as ever. Hello, that's new. It's an awful lot like what possessed the queen way back in uh, episode 8 or 9. I guess it goes to show that this is probably the Black Calamity that we've been worried about all this time. Check it out, the weapons just pop up. It would be really funny to go into the scene equipped with just like the bomb and maybe the draw card as opposed to an actual weapon. Check out that evil laugh it's got, the dark mist. Yep, this is definitely the exact same eyeball mist that possessed the queen. I guess that means that the, the uh, little face that flashed during McTube's speech is the actual boss of the game. And these things are just controlling us to get to whatever's locked at the bottom of the Dream Temple. Makes enough sense, I suppose. Anyway, clearly this thing works via possession, so... It's gonna take advantage of whatever's lying around. Of course it picks up the teddy bear that Chiffon has in her dream, and not any of the monsters that we've been fighting, and possibly, you know, making them more threatening or whatever. I guess this is sort of ironic, but it's not particularly threatening. I guess we're also, like... thankful that Chiffon's just as girly on the outside. On the inside, rather, as she is on the outside, because if she had secretly been into s or something, we might have been in some serious trouble. Anyway, this thing's pretty easy. You know that we hit it a couple times, and it didn't actually do any damage in its life meter while it's punching us. It's because the Dark Mist is not the bear, of course. We have to draw the Dark Mist out of the bear. This is a little tantrum thing. I'm not really sure what that's all about. After a while, it'll just all of a sudden flop on the ground like that. I, don't e I didn't even have to poke it there. And, uh, now we have the Snake Fang again. Actually, I remembered it this time. It draws the darkness out of the bear, and we can arbalest it to death. You get exactly three hits before it dives back in the bear while it shoots lightning at us. So you use the charge attack to maximize the damage you can do each time it comes out. After you hit it the third time, it'll continue to shoot at us, but it'll go in this long spiraling animation back into the bear. You can't actually hurt it during this time period. There we go. So it should take, using the charge attack, about three shots with the level three arbalest. Probably goes a little bit faster if I get in the Arbalest up to level 4, where the attack power doubles, but you know, whatever. This is not a particularly threatening boss battle. Again, we have 8, we have 50 health points. And his attacks are pretty easy to block. You can even interrupt some of his punches, like I did here. He can block the Arbalest attacks if you try to hit him in the, directly into the face. Uh, so you actually have to use your melee attacks. There we go, oops. Bear punch. Yeah, all of a sudden he just trips. I'm not really sure what the deal is. Walk right up to him. It's very difficult to lock onto him for some reason. It's easy to just like walk right in front of him and sort of reach out and grab him with the claw like he's standing right in front of us. No, that's the hammer. The hammer is useless. I've been having a lot of trouble using it the entire time. The lightning attacks are the same problem that Casey's lightning attacks did back in Lillian's dream. Though. They're mostly particle effects, which makes it a little bit difficult to figure out what their hit hitbox is. Sigh. That's two. One more should do it. Just a short nut fight that I didn't really feel like, uh, or didn't feel like it was necessary to edit any of it out. I guess th three repetitions is pretty standard for a, a platforming game boss fight before you either change patterns or beat the boss. In this case, the bosses never change patterns in this game. So I guess three, three repetitions is all we get. I kind of wish you did the repeating punch again, it was kind of funny. Getting uh, mauled to death by a teddy bear. Combo attack. Just keep the uh, snake fang on, reach out, and claw him. And this should do it. There's not even a, a hit animation when you hit him the last time. He just dies. The camera angle is really weird, too, for this part. Shocking, I know, that we have those. We've only been fighting him with them the entire time. In fact, he's probably been watching us in the dream, too. Okay, there we go. See? The final blow is struck from through the dark mist for some reason as the camera pans upward. I guess 
during the cutscenes they have problems controlling the camera too. I guess it's, I'm glad to know it's not just me. So we did it, cutscene time. Talk about a downer. I know this is supposed to be really stereotypical, but she's uh, serious, but she's so stereotypically emo that it's hard to take this little sequence seriously. I like how they did Toma's Dream, which had a very similar scenario compared to this one, with the whole recurring nightmare thing and Toma sort of changing from the buff rogue from his youth to like the fat old man that he is now. It hits the point home a little bit better that he's moved on. This is just kind of stilted. Plus, like, Abel's a real ghost, as opposed to Marco, who is just a figment of Toma's imagination. Still really sweet, though, I guess. I'm kind of disappointed they didn't bring back the Sheep Angels, too, from Toma's Dream, but I guess they actually want you to take this level seriously? I don't know. I'm also glad they didn't, uh try to record some really crummy voice acting of Chiffon singing. Generally speaking, games with voice acting, that, uh, should, I should say, low-budget games that attempt to put a singer in their games, usually either, you usually either wind up with really crummy vocoder singing, or some just awful, like, girlfriend of one of the directors or whatever trying to sing and failing miserably. But they didn't cheapen the sequence by trying to do that. And of course, I'm cheapening the sequence by talking over it, but whatever, that's my job. I guess an alternate hypothesis for the sequence is that Abel, just like Marco, is still a figment of Chiffon's imagination, but as Stompy becomes more dream attuned, he could see the visions when he picked up her pendant. I don't know, it's a possibility. I kind of want to fast forward this sequence, too. I guess the third explanation is that we're becoming just as crazy as everybody else on this island and we're just starting to see the same things that they see, like some group mass hallucination. Maybe there's something in the water, like Sano Stone dust or whatever. It's like this universe's version of crack cocaine or something. Again, we'll never actually hear her voice, unlike McToof, who had a little sequence. McToof, of course, can play the background music like he does in his own scene, so we know he's a decent musician. Alright, that's enough of that. Bumble looks happy. He's not dancing, though, which means this must be serious. All right, off he goes. No sheep angels. Guess he knows the way himself. I mean, he's been dead for quite a while. Probably. Check it out. When she's running, she uses the same uh, footstep sound that we use when we're walking on the ice. It's a nice touch that sort of maintains a consistency between cutscenes and actual gameplay. You can hear it again when Stompy's moving. But, uh, it's a little thing that I noticed that I think is interesting. Anyway, that's all. Time to leave Chiffon's Dream. Of course, we'll be back. You'll remember that we didn't pick up a single ring the entire time there, and there are definitely a hundred of them like there are in every level. So we'll have to come back pretty soon. Good question. Can you talk? The other is yes or nothing. I guess the answer could be no. That'd be a little ironic. Check it out. Bumble gives a little nod, and she gives him a little wave. Maybe she can see Bumble? Maybe people who have already seen him in the dream can see him in real life, which is a little strange. Create some odd inconsistencies in the real-world versions of most of the scenes in this game with people other than McTooth. Considering Bumble thought it was shocking that, Mc that McTooth could see him at all. Anyway, let's go inside and see if we can get back in her dream, because there's plenty still to do. There always is. Nope, she's awake. We'll have to uh, backdoor mine screw through McTube's dream. That seems like a destination for now. 
really want to get to a thousand rings and pick up the next unlockable. It's the only unlockable other than the 100% completion ones that we're missing so far. I'd like to try to get that as soon as possible. Oops, wrong way. Let's get out of here. Yeah. So let's uh, head on over to the cavern. Or we could do a cutscene. This guy looks pretty cool. If this is an actual RPG with multiple party members, I would say he's a pretty good candidate for the fighter with that long coat and the no shirt or whatever. It's a fashion statement, I guess. Sarty! He's a fighter. Yep, looks like a fighter. He's basically wearing a martial arts, martial arts outfit. Well, we know what to do. We actually have to go back during the daytime. He's asleep during the day, I think, or he might be actually asleep all the time until you actually go into his room for the first time. And you just have to zone a couple times to get him to actually show up in his room. Let's go check it out. Stompy is admiring him while he sleeps. That's pretty creepy, even by the standards of this game. Let's get inside. Sarti is one of the optional dreams, like Phoebe and Parfait. It is the Colosseum, in case it is incredibly obvious from this opening sequence, and there's a ton of stuff to find here. Way more than in the other optional dreams, that's because there's a ton of challenges for us to undergo here, and this is actually why I've been trying to grind the weapons evenly as much as possible, because this is where we want to have them at level 4. So, as I continue to work through the challenges, I'll probably take some time to grind off-camera to make sure that we can max out our weapons, to make the rest of the game pretty smooth, and to be able to finish the most of the objectives in this stream. Sarti is actually the last of all the dreams that we can enter, in which we haven't yet met the person until now if that makes sense. We've met every other character we'll be entering the dream, except him. And now we've met him, there we go. An HP up in there, I kinda want it, can't get it yet. Let's pick up all these rings really quickly. I've never actually showed this before in some of these optional dreams, you can pick up most of the rings sort of tangentially to the objective. But you can get 99, not 100, and it crosses over the 1000 ring mark for the first time, so that's nice. Let's go ahead and vainly try to use the hammer again successfully. The hundredth ring is actually behind the portcullis where the HP up fragment is, and we won't be able to get at it until we complete the challenge that opens the gate. There's actually an interesting bit of uh, care on the part of the developers, because initially I assumed that since we can pick up HP up fragments with the draw card, that we'll be able to walk up to the gate and pick it up through the gate without actually completing the objective. And then they put the ring in there just to make sure that you completed all the objectives anyway to ensure that it was a requirement for getting 100% completion on the stream. But as it turns out, as we pass by the gate, you saw I did so while I was picking up the rings scattered around the arena, I could not draw the HPF fragment through the gate. In fact, I couldn't lock onto it at all. So that's nice, I guess. Just means it's something to look forward to at the end of all of this beyond satisfaction. Anyway, these red guys are weaker than the black drops that we fought in most of the extensions in some of the recent dreams, but a little bit more aggressive. So I guess they're fitting enemies for this stage in the game. At the very least, they're fitting for an introductory sequence to a dream that's entirely about combat. And here we go. Sarti is one of the only people who's entirely in control of his own dream, so he can do pretty much whatever he wants. I guess him and Phoebe are just about it. There he is. Also have to have passion or something or whatever. Burning spirit. There he is, yep, he can teleport, and Stompy is for some reason shocked that he can do this. I mean, it is his brain, you can go wherever he wants. I guess we're used to people like Yuri bumbling around their own dreams. Alright, much like uh, Toma's dream, the very first thing we do, I guess after the initial challenge, is a boss fight. We are fighting Sarti. He's pretty cool. One of the only fights in the game that's pure combat with very little puzzle elements to it. He gets the little, little kick attack, he can fight fire Hadoukens and do this jump kick. His pattern is typically, okay, he's got that little uppercut. He only uses that if you get too far away from him. His pattern is pretty straightforward. He'll do those Hadoukens, then he'll do a jump kick, and then he'll usually lead right back into either the spin kick or the little Hadouken set again. There we go. The easiest way to beat him is just to use the level 3 combo attack between the spear and the sword, unless you happen to have one or more of the other weapons at level 4. It takes off about a sixth of his health to do a single combo, and he's usually vulnerable after he fires off either his dash attack or his head dukings. Once he gets really low, he gets a little bit faster, either that or my timing just got screwed up a lot of trying to do this, so to get the last actual couple of hits it took me a little while, but otherwise, it's a pretty simple, straightforward fight. I think too rough. Yeah, there we go, he gets a little bit faster.
nothing too rough, though. He says we barely beat him, but realistically, he didn't come close to killing us. I don't think I lost more than two pieces of health the entire time. Usually topped off Bumble's tummy right away. He gets introspe introspective for a while, because it wouldn't be a level in this game if they didn't do some soul-searching at the end of it. But mostly this is about fighting, which is fun! This is my favorite of the optional dreams. Bumble's a fan, he knows what's up. This guy gets back on his feet pretty quickly. Not that he was off his feet or worried about something until now. So we will come back here in the next episode. There's plenty to do here. It's significantly more fun than Chiffon's dream, so I think I'll do this one first and clear it out. But first, let's pick up our reward for actually beating Sarti. We get some dream energy and the third draw card, which gives us all three and we can keep all three elements at our side at all time. We'll pick up the rest of the rewards tomorrow on Let's Play Duel Hearts. See you then. Wow.